Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show back in our studio, where today we take stock of this year's dramatic developments in Irish politics. Almost unnoticed in the shadow of a world pandemic, February's election breakthrough by Sinn Féin has sparked an historic realignment in Irish politics, with an unprecedented alliance between arch-rivals Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. Today, we discuss with key players from Sinn Féin and the Greens how this will shape the future of Ireland post-Brexit and post-pandemic. And we ask Eamon Malley, Ireland's most respected commentator, to give us an overview of what these developments in the South mean for the politics of the North. Now, in last week's show, we asked the second longest serving Taoiseach or Prime Minister since Irish independence for his assessment. This is what Bertie Ahern had to say. My view is not that we should never do it. Of course, I, I, I'm a Republican. Um, uh, it is the aim of, number one aim of Fianna Fáil, the party I led and for years and was actively involved at every level uh, that unification of the country. But it has to be done properly, uh, properly organised, properly negotiated, trying to convince people uh, any other way will only lead to, to hardship and failure. And now to your tweets, emails and messages in response to last week's show, which featured in the Belfast Telegraph, who wrote a piece about Alex's interview of Bertie Ahern. Now, Sam, who read the piece in the Belfast Telegraph, said, Respectfully, it will not happen without unionist consent, having lived in Belfast for 76 years. To call for United Ireland now would only reward terrorism. Sam then went off to actually watch our show and wrote back to say, I watched your show last night. I will confess that I found nothing in the content that would be offensive to my unionist position. I therefore offer you a sincere apology for premature judgment. Thank you, Sam, so kind. He goes on to say, I suggest you sue the Belfast Telegraph, lol. Well, we won't be suing the Belfast Telegraph, but we hope you continue to watch the show, Sam. Thanks so much for writing. Terry says, great show, well done, Ireland. Flourishing in the wider world and respected as well. This too could be Scotland. Sigh. Fiona says, that was excellent. Interesting as always to listen to the guests on the Alex Salmon show. Fiona says, Bertie crashed the economy in Ireland in 2009. To which Christopher responds, we could argue the globalist banking elite was to blame for the financial crash that pretty much affected every soul on earth. And finally, we hear from Alison who says, always a delight to listen to someone with credibility talk on TV. An amoral coalition in the free state. Alex now continues the debate with Sinn Féin housing spokesman Owen O'Brien TD. Owen O'Brien is a rising star of Sinn Féin and re responsible for housing, one of the policies that helped the party have such a successful 2020 election campaign. He's been a member of the, the Doyle for Dublin Midwest since 2016. He now joins me from his office in the Doyle. Owen, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Alex, thanks very much for having me. Now, this question that, uh, by general assent, Sinn Féin scored heavily in the, in the election in February because of the, the articulation of social policies, like your own subject of housing and finance and the health service, is it true to say that that was the cause of the, the breakthrough rather than support for uh, United Ireland? Well, what's interesting is if you look at the exit poll data, for example, that uh, uh, the state broadcaster RTE did here, uh, while issues like housing and health were absolutely central to our electoral success, there still is a very, very strong groundswell of opinion in favour uh, of constitutional change in United Ireland. And particularly among our core vote, uh, a United Ireland continues to be of equal importance uh, as, for example, improvements in health and housing, childcare, etc. So for us, we don't make a distinction between the two. And I think increasingly what people are realising and something they've learned from, from the advances uh, of the independence movement in Scotland is that if you articulate your proposals for constitutional change in the context of and alongside genuine improvements in people's social and economic well-being, uh, then those two sets of arguments enhance each other. And I think both are the reasons why we did so well in the February election. So February was a spectacular success. So you topped the poll, you ended up with 37 seats in the Doyle, but it could have been 45 if you'd put up enough candidates. Is there a suspicion that you might have missed the boat and let uh, the old parties, uh, Fianna Foyle and Fianna Gael, steal the show? Have you, have you lost a great opportunity to, to lead the government in the Doyle? 
I don't think we've lost an opportunity, uh, but I think there was uh, uh, nobody either in, in the political parties or indeed in the media who saw the kind of dramatic swing that took place during the election campaign. There's always going to be another election, uh, and you know that, Alex, as well as I do. Uh, and what's interesting is the opinion polls since the general election have showed Sinn Féin consolidating those gains and, in fact, in some cases, increasing up to about 27 percent. So if and when there's another election, uh, we'll be ready to fight in every single constituency to maximise our, our vote. Uh, and in the meantime, we're going to hold this ramshackle government uh, to account by being the most effective party of opposition the state has ever seen. But that ramshackle government, uh, uh, as you put it, is well capable of stealing your clothes. Now, your book on social housing and public housing was very well received last year. But don't you think uh, that Fianna Foyle and Fianna Gael, and indeed with the, the Green Party in there as well, will, will read the ruins and say, we better take up some of these ideas on public housing in, in Dublin in particular? Don't you think there's a, a danger? that you face, that the new government will say these popular policies of Sinn Féin are exactly the sort of thing we should be doing? Well, first of all, if, if this government decided to adopt Sinn Féin policy, I'd be very pleased, because it at least would mean uh, issues that for a long time have left many working people behind and housing, health, childcare, pensions, etc., would be resolved. So I'd have no difficulty with that. But in fact, what we've seen with the new programme for government uh, and also with the legislation in the first four weeks of this government is they have no intention of following our policies. I mean, we've just come from a vote, for example, in, in the uh, temporary parliament here in the convention centre on, uh, on the River Liffey. Uh, and the government has just ended crucial protection for renters. Uh, we had a ban on evictions, rent increases and notice to quit as part of COVID-19. That is now effectively gone and in its place is very limited protections for small numbers of renters. Centers. Likewise, for example, on affordable housing and social housing, there is no indication government is going to meet the level of investment that's required to tackle those problems. Uh, and again, on key issues like the right to retire with a state pension at 65, a genuinely affordable childcare, a single tier national health service, nothing in the programme for government suggests that there'll be movement on any of that. And crucially, Michal Martin, who's our new Taoiseach, who, who says he leads uh, uh, Fianna Fáil, the self-proclaimed Republican Party, is saying that we can't have uh, a referendum on Irish unity in the lifetime of this government. Uh, so uh, I have to say, if your question is, am I fearful that our policy clothes will be stolen by this government, the very opposite. It's more of the same failed centre-right Fine Gael policy we've had for the last four years. Uh, and unfortunately, it looks like both Fianna Fáil and the Green Party are buckling under the weight of that centre-right party. I'm in my interview with Bertie Ahern last week, he said, look, we've been talking about uh, reunification for 100 years, but the spade work, the, the detailed work hasn't been done. Now, in a situation where that work is still to be done, isn't the, the Taoiseach right to not to talk about a, a border poll in the, in the near future? Don't you have to do the work first? Well, the first thing is, is the two aren't mutually exclusive. Uh, I mean, it's, it's quite an admission of failure uh, that Bertie Ahern, who led three successive governments here, uh, admits, and of course he's right, that when he was leader, he didn't do that spade work, albeit he made a very important contribution uh, uh, to the 1998 Belfast Agreement and subsequent peace. Uh, but what we need from the government now, whether it's a government of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael or a government of Sinn Féin and others, is to start putting in place the building blocks that will allow that referendum to take place. Keep in mind, Sinn Féin doesn't want to have a referendum that we would lose. We want to make sure that all of the research, all of the data and all of the dialogue that's so necessary, both formal dialogue at a party political level, but also the community grassroots dialogue that's equally as important, that all of that happens. So. Sinn Féin can't unite Ireland by ourselves. It's not something we can do on our own. This is something we want to do in partnership with all sections of political and civil society opinion on the island that believe Irish unification is the right thing uh, for all of our peoples. But you have to do the work, and the work needs to start now. Uh, and I think if we continue to do what we've done to date, not only express dissatisfaction with the failure of government policies, but also show people there is a better way. We can have a public housing system with genuinely affordable homes for working people. We can have affordable childcare. We can have a single-tier national health service where people get treated on the basis of medical need, not ability to pay. And we can have a peaceful and democratic and respectful transition uh, to profound constitutional change and reunification. Uh, I think all of those things will grow. Uh, I think this is a really exciting time to be in Irish politics, north and south, uh, and a very exciting time, of course, to be a, a member of Sinn Féin. So lots of opportunities ahead, but equally lots and lots of important work for us to get right. Bona Brown from Dublin, thank you so much for joining me on The Alex Salmon Show.
Thank you very much. Now, no one personally represents the concept of Global Ireland better than new Lord Mayor of Dublin, Hazel Shu. She is the first Irish-born person of Chinese descent elected to political office in the Republic and represents the, the third party in the new coalition government, the Green Party. Lord Mayor, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Welcome, Alex. Hi, everyone. Now, you're the 352nd Lord Mayor of Dublin. The other major development in green politics uh, in Ireland, apart from your election as, uh, as Lord Mayor, is the party's gone into the, the new coalition government with 12 TDs, the coalition between Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. Is that going to be a, a comfortable experience for a, a radical green party to be in a, a coalition of two parties which hadn't always been known for their the radicalism, either of them? Well, uh, I'm in a slightly more awkward position. I am the chair of the party, actually. So, uh, and I can tell you, comfortable? No, absolutely not. But I don't think politics should be comfortable. They're not natural bedfellows, uh, and we all know that, and no one's under any illusions of that. And I don't think they are to each other um, naturally because they've always been um, two opposite civil uh, war, war po uh, parties. But everyone does have to work together. And in these pandemic times, that's what's needed of the people of the community. So it should be needed of the parties and politicians. And that's what we we'll have to do. And I do think we will deliver that change. We have to work very hard for that change. There will be plenty of sacrifices by all, but there will also be plenty of things that we can achieve, especially when it comes to rowing back um, climate change. Now, you are the, uh, the first uh, woman of colour to, to be elected Lord Mayor of, uh, of Dublin. Uh, the immediate past Taoiseach, uh, Lee Varadka, was the first openly gay person to uh, assume the office of, uh, of Taoiseach. Are these signs of the increasing cosmopolitan nature of Irish politics? Uh, is it almost a personification of the, the concept of global Ireland, which uh, is being enunciated by the new administration? Uh, cosmopolitan, that's actually a great word for it. Uh, yeah, I, I think that could be where we're heading, but more so, I think it, it's good to see, uh, I think the better word is openness. I'm the first person of colour in a role that is 352 years strong. So there's been 351 Lord Mayors before me that wasn't um, uh, anyone of colour. I'm the ninth female Lord Mayor. And again, there's 343 uh, Lord Mayors that were men. And this is what we need to look at. It is good that I am the first, but I cannot be the last. Now, Lord Mayor, if I, I can turn to, to your uh, party role as, uh, as chair of the party, what's going to be the template on which we should judge the Green Party's first experience or new experience of, uh, of such an influential role in the coalition government? So there are definitely specifics because that's what we negotiate within the programme for government. The general is that we must have climate change, but not at a cost of um, social justice. We need to make sure that we secure housing. We need to make sure that we secure a, a just transition for all. And we need to ensure that we have an economy uh, that doesn't involve massive spending cuts in year three or four, so that we continue as it is to, to get us through the worst of times right now. The Fina Foyle, Fina Gale, uh, old hands uh, in the door, let's call them that, you know, Mel Martin, Leo Varadka, uh, the various politicians, lots of experience of government. How are you going to keep your eye on Fianna Foyle and Fianna Gael to, to stop them pulling fast ones on you? That's always a risk being the smaller party. I, I think uh, we, we both know that as a smaller party, you, you can always sometimes get, you know, not sometimes, always get eaten alive when in government. Um, make no mistake, if, if there are issues, we will be challenging them. If there is anything going against our policy or any, uh, any affecting the overall most vulnerable, and it's a cost to them, we will be walking when we think that this is no longer good for the public. Lord Mayor. Best wishes for your term of office and thank you so much for joining me on the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you. Join us after the break where we continue the discussion with the doyen of Irish political commentators, Eamon Malley. We'll see you then. Welcome back. 
Over 30 years of troubles in the north of Ireland, Eamon Malley was a constant voice of reasoned commentary. How does he assess the dramatic developments in the, the landscape of Irish politics? Eamon Malley, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much indeed, Alex. I want to start by taking a look at uh, politics in the, in the south, uh, Eamon. This, uh, what I thought, dramatic coalition between the, the old Civil War rivals, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, changing the landscape of, uh, of uh, politics in the Doyle. Do you look at this as a more permanent feature, you know, even leading, as some have suggested, to a merger in the, the medium term? Do you, do you think this is a, a realignment of, uh, of uh, politics in the Republic? Well, it is quite a remarkable development, but the two big parties, per se, traditional parties, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, uh, they were in lockstep on the whole Brexit issue. So there was sort of a marriage of convenience already there. And then Fine Gael did not uh, get the, the result one might have expected against the backdrop of the performance and the handling of Brexit. And uh, at the end of the day, Fine Fáil and Fine Gael did the unthinkable they turned the clock back and uh, they decided to go into government with the help of the Greens. So it's quite, quite remarkable. Uh, and what's even more remarkable is that Leo Varadkar, the Taunish, the, the former Taoiseach and leader of Fine Gael, is uh, like about 20 points or about 18 points ahead of Michal Martin, the Taoiseach, in the current polls. So what does that tell you about uh, polling? It's extraordinary that Varadkar is so popular now, he could walk on water because of his handling uh, of the whole uh, COVID-19 business. Surely after a hundred years, if the civil war division in politics in the, in the Doyle has now been changed, that must be a, a matter of long-term significance. Well, uh, Alex, uh, you know, we all change with the passing of time. But young generations, they change everything, and we, we, we shouldn't lose sight of that. So the hurt of the civil war it's a long time ago, and people are seeing the world somewhat differently now. Thank God, I say. Now, you said the two parties in lockstep in, in their opposition to, to Brexit. Uh, they're also in lockstep in their attitude to the Constitution uh, in Ireland, uh, both uh, urging a, a cautious approach. So was there a sort of collective sigh of relief in, uh, in Northern Irish unionism uh, that uh, Michal Martin and Leo Varadkar the old firm, let's call them that, are, are still in charge. No, 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 Alex. You don't ever find a sigh of relief within unionism. Unionism has always got us back to the wall. It's always living in dread and fear. This very day, there's a bill going through uh, at the Parliament buildings at the moment, which is giving more power back to the individual minister as opposed to collectivism uh, as a result of a court case. And unionism is up in arms today. They feel that, they're, that they're, they're, they are being diminished. So unionism is constantly with its back to the wall and it, very, it takes an awful lot to comfort them. So who knows what's going to happen down the line. But there was a lot of hostility here to Leo Varadkar over Brexit. He was, he was seen as, as the devil in disguise, you know, Mr. Nice Man, uh, Leo Varadkar, but they really, really didn't like him at all. The irony is they might have more empathy and sympathy with Michal Martin, the Fianna Fáil leader, isn't it odd? And in terms of the handling of, of COVID, where, generally speaking, there's been a, a great deal of praise for the Irish government, uh, and, and indeed the, the instance of, uh, of the pandemic is much less in the north of Ireland than, uh, than in, the, in the UK, particularly in England. Uh, is that changing attitudes to politics, you know, this demonstration that Ireland seems to have largely succeeded in controlling the virus where London seems to be struggling? Well, you know, it, it depends on what you call succe success. Personally, I think that there's been an absolute abdication of responsibility by those in charge when it comes to uh, care homes in Northern Ireland. 50 plus 1 percent of all people who died as a result of COVID uh, died in, in care homes in Northern Ireland. Now, that hurts me. That hurts me deeply to think that somebody of my generation, and I'm not so sure what age you are, but I'm, I've hit the 70 mark now. So 
people like me would would be considered disposable and uh, the all the all the eggs really in the basket uh, those eggs were all put in the nhs hospital baskets and the poor people in the care homes uh, they were just left blowing in the wind and uh, that's why we're 50 plus one percent of all who died in northern Ireland died in care homes now if you have a brother in a care home or a mother or a, a granny uh, and then uh, not alone do they die alone but then you couldn't even go to the funeral in many cases so there's a lot of hurt remaining here and when the when the inquiry and the inquest and all the rest takes place um, I think that a few people will have a lot of questions to ask, uh, for which to answer when it comes to the end of the day. Can I question Bertie Hearn uh, about the attitude to reunification? One of the points he made was that despite talking about it for a century and fighting about it for quite a bit of the century, he said that very little of the, the groundwork, the, the real detailed, granular groundwork that would have to be done the preparations that would have to be made to even put the question, very little of that, he argued, had been completed. Is that a, a fair point or, or not? No, I think, I think that's a very prudent approach. I think it's very sensible. And uh, it's not the first time I've heard that argument prosecuted. In fact, a, a very senior, a retired a former Irish civil servant, one of the most brilliant men I've ever met, uh, he said the same thing to me. He said the best brains... In, in, in Ireland and in Britain should be sitting down. Uh, retired civil servants, judges, and all these people of high intellect, they're the people who should be sitting down now, uh, engaging in what you call that granular detail to look at the, the, the various situations which might arise to obviate a recurrence of violence here, because that is the real danger. You could have your border poll, and you could have a, a majority in, in that border poll. But what have you gained if you replace the IRA with a loyalist IRA? What, what have we gained if loyalism will take up the guns then and, and, and we'll be back to where we were for 30 years? So if any uh, constitutional change is to take place, I think it has to be very, very carefully planned discussed and understood and you have to bring leading opinion from within unionism into that conversation you cannot go over their heads and, and realize that constitutional change because i think that the, the downside of that will be loyalist violence and that must be obviated at all costs alex hey and Mali, I, I know i happen to know that you're busy writing your autobiography at the at the present moment and I, i'm sure it's going to be redolent and packed full of amazing stories from the, your journalistic uh, career but but when as one does in these occasions you turn your mind to the future perhaps in the, the concluding chapter of the, the autobiography well, what sort of a, events are you going to forecast what developments do you foresee in the uh, in the island of ireland and then for the north of ireland in particular well, in, in essence, as far as I'm concerned, I've lived on the, the so-called Brit Union. I, I have lived in Dublin as, as a student for, for five years. I, no flag ever fed me in the words, the famous words of John Hume, you can't eat a flag. And I'm just grateful having lived through the horror of the violence, Alex. And I saw Le Mans, I saw Oma, I saw so much, you have no idea. I was there, I saw the bodies being pulled out. That was commonplace in, in, to my eyes for so many years. So I, I don't want any situation arising which would endanger the peace which we're enjoying now. It's just very hard to take in, Alex, where we are today comparable to where we were uh, 20 years ago, 25 years, 30 years ago. And he, he, and I have to say, I bear no grudge against Ian Paisley. And Ian Paisley, and I know you and Ian were quite friendly, but there are, in the Nationalist Party's Catholic community, he was a hit figure for so many years, but he did the right thing at the end of the day. And that's all I want from people. Do the right thing, do the decent thing. But my, in essence, about the future, if we don't get to know each other, 
and I mean Protestants, Catholics, Nationalists, Unionists. There is no solution to getting to know each other. A great friend of mine, a promoter, Jim Aiken, he used to always say to me, he was much older than I was, Eamon, I lament so much that I haven't got the facility or the faculty you have for crossing the divide. Well, he was of another generation. People didn't cross the divide. My generation, our children, they went to Protestant state schools. We crossed the line. And my, my son's friends come from all sides of the community here. And those are, that's the new generation. And I just hope that they'll get on with working together and let the politics look after itself down the line. Evan Malley, doyen of Northern Irish journalism, thank you so much for joining me in the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much indeed, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Under the cover of COVID and Brexit, a quiet political revolution has taken place in the Doyle. The two great parties of state and deadly rivals for a century are now in coalition, which some say could even pave the way to a merger. Their agreement is given stability by the presence of the Greens, particularly necessary since the pandemic has boosted the ratings of Fianna Gael at the expense of Fianna Foyle. The coalition will face tough choices in the challenges of the post-pandemic and post-Brexit age. However, there's plenty of experience and ballast in the new government, and the Greens may provide that touch of radicalism, which a restless electorate were clearly searching for earlier this year. The new government has already signalled its policy as prioritising recovery, doubling down on the concept of a global island, and a cautious building towards a shared island, rather than forcing the pace to a united Ireland. However, Sinn Féin are also well-placed to take advantage as the now unrivaled party of opposition. Once the Irish electorate emerges from the COVID-induced political hibernation, they may want to see more vigour on social, economic and constitutional politics. And now from Taz and myself and all at the show, it's goodbye for now, stay safe, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>